Right, in our last video we had a look at the genetic control of metabolism in microorganisms, looking at mutagenesis and looking at selective breeding programs. In this one we're going to have a look at recombinant DNA technology. So what do we mean by recombinant DNA technology? Well, we could think of this in terms of a posh way of saying genetic engineering. So you have met this before. It's where you're transferring gene sequences between organisms or to another from a different species. So you're moving genes from one organism to another. And in this topic here, we're looking at microorganisms and why might you want to change or improve the genes or make improvements to a microorganism? Well, you might want to actually produce an increase in the yield of a substance. So you could use genetic engineering to amplify a specific metabolic step in the pathway. Or you could use, well, I call it recombinant DNA technology to change the microorganism so that it actually secretes the useful thing that you're hoping to get and make lots of money out of. It would be very nice if the microorganism secreted that into the culture media that you're growing it in in the fermenter. Or you could use recombinant DNA technology to change your microbe so that in some way it won't survive out in the outside environment. And you could do that to, by making it dependent on some sort of thing that you've got in the particular growth media, some special ingredient that you've got in there and it only grows on that. So you could change it like that or you could adjust it that it wouldn't work, it wouldn't survive in a different temperature, something like that. But in order to reduce the chance of your genetically engineered microorganism surviving outside in the environment and that's why I've got there it's making it safe so you're not contaminating the environment with genetically mod modified organisms. Well we'll do a quick recap of your N5 work on genetic engineering. So the idea behind geogenetic engineering is you've got some sort of gene that is producing some sort of useful product and in this example here it's looking at a human chromosome with a gene on it and that gene gets extracted from the chromosome and you'll see here it uses or I've got the word here an endonuclease we'll talk about those more in a moment and th these are the enzymes that are used to cut the gene out and so we end up with the gene that we want and you'll notice something here called sticky ends, and we're going to talk about these shortly as well. So we just need to think at the moment of the gene that we want being cut out. And then we've got our bacterium that we're going to genetically modify. And we've got our plasmid that is here. And it's the plasmid that we are wanting to cut open. And again, we use this endonuclease. It's an enzyme that will cut open the DNA and it cuts open our plasmid. And you'll notice here we've got sticky end here and I'll explain them in a moment too. You'll also notice that there's a wee marker gene here for resistance to antibiotic. So we're using a bacteria that's got this gene already in it, in the plasmid. And we'll see why that is in a moment as well. So what is, happens now is that the gene from the human chromosome is inserted into the plasmid that we've got from our bacteria. And we use something called ligase, and we'll talk about that more as well. So here we, we are. We end up with our plasmid here with the required gene in it. But you'll notice that I've got another couple of plasmids here that don't have the required gene in them. Now that is because you need to imagine this, you're not doing it with just one bacteria, you are doing this process with a whole lot of bacteria. So you're taking this gene that you want and you're trying to get into the plasmids of a whole lot of bacteria. So, you, But the problem is that not all of those plasmids are going to take the gene up. Some of them will, some of them won't. And so you end up with a mixture of plasmids, some of which have the gene in them and some of them which don't. So what you're wanting to do is to try and 
separate these out and we'll have a look at how that is done on the next slide. So the next step in the process, if you remember on the previous slide, we've got a number of plasmids that are there, some of which have got the required gene in them and some of them which haven't got it in. Now you take these plasmids and you try and get them into the host bacterial cells. So these are the bacteria that you're going to use to produce the useful product. Now, when you take that bacteria and you try and get the plasmids into them, not all of these bacteria cells will take up the plasmid. So you end up with some host cells with no plasmid there. Or some of the bacteria will take up the plasmid that has got the gene that you want in it. And some of the bacteria will take up the plasmids that don't have the required gene in it. So this one here doesn't have the gene that you're wanting. Now, remember you're wanting to make lots of money from this. So the last thing you want to be doing is growing a whole lot of bacteria that don't have the gene in them that produces the product you want. So how do you separate them out? Well, that's the reason why you've got the antibiotic marker or resistance to antibiotic marker gene there for ampicillin. So what you do is you grow all of these bacteria here on an agar medium with the antibiotic. And when you do that, well, these ones here don't have the antibiotic resistance gene, so they just automatically die. These ones that are here go on to survive. So what you need to do is then separate these out because you're only actually wanting this one here. And so what happens is they extract DNA from the samples of, the, of these colonies that are here, these bacterial colonies, and they screen them to see if the gene is there. And of course they find that in this one here the gene isn't there, so those ones are discarded. And what they do is they then go on to use this one here, which is now known as a reprogrammed bacterium, and it's got the required gene in it, and it's now used as, I, I suppose you could think of it as a wee factory to produce lots and lots of the product that you want. And what about that term that we used about at the beginning here called recombinant DNA technology? Well, this here, this cell here, is re uh, referred to, or the DNA in, that's inside it, is referred to as recombinant DNA. I have trouble saying that word. And because you've, I suppose you can think of it in terms of you've recombined the DNA inside the cell. That's one of the ways of thinking of it. Now we're going to go on to have a look at, in more detail about some of the tools that are used for this job of producing recombinant DNA. And I've already mentioned a couple of these, and that is the restriction endonuclease, that's a type of enzyme, and the DNA ligase. We'll go on to talk about ve a vector and artificial chromosomes as well. So we'll cover all of these in the next slides. You may remember from the slide that we had before when we started looking at this genetic modification or genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology, is that we had to cut open the gene from the donor organism, in other words, the human gene. We had to cut that out and we had to also cut open the bacterial plasmid. Now, the thing that does that is a restriction endonuclease. It's an enzyme that is used to cut open these two things. And the thing about an, a, a restriction endonuclease is that the enzyme is able to re recognise as a specific short se sequence of DNA bases. And those wee short sequences are called restriction sites. So let's have a look at these restriction endonucleases and these restriction sites. Now there are a number of different enzymes that can be used. You don't have to know the names of them, but you do need to know that there are different ones and they will cut open or they recognise these different restriction sites. Now, restriction site is basically just a short sequence of DNA. It can be maybe four to eight nucleotides in length and it's found in both DNA strands. So it's kind of running in opposite directions. So like this one is 
here and then it's running like that and then this one here. So these are the restriction sequences here. Now what happens is when we have a look at this enzyme here, enzyme 1, well this enzyme it cuts between the G and C. Now it happens to be that on this here the G and C are both here in the same position. So the cut is made here and so you end up with what is referred to as these, as these two blunt ends and we'll have a look at some of the importance of that just shortly. This enzyme, enzyme 2 here, what it does is, you'll see the sequence GATC running one way and then the other way running GATC and the enzyme makes its cut at the G point here and so therefore on the other one here the G is here so the cut that is made here is not a straight across cut it's this kind of cut here like that as it cuts the DNA and that results in this sequence being here and this sequence being here it results in these two sticky ends in other words the two ends of the DNA stick out without the corresponding bases at the other side. And it does the same here on this one here. The cut in this is made between the A and the G. And here is the A and G here at this side. So when the cut is made, you end up with these sticky ends. Now the importance of this is that when you cut open the human chromosome and the plasmid, you have to make sure that you use the same enzyme. And the reason for that is to do with these sticky ends. Because if you imagine, if you used enzyme 1 and you have cut open your human chromosome, you'll end up with your gene having blunt ends. And if you cut open your plasmid with enzyme 2, you'll end up with a plasmid that has got, and of course my art isn't necessarily up to this, but you'll end up with a plasmid with a sticky end here, and a plasmid with a sticky end here. And because this has got a blunt end, that's not going to fit in here, because the sequences aren't going to match up. So you have to use the same enzyme. If you were cutting open with this one, you'd have to make sure your plasmid and your human chromosome has got the blunt ends. If, in the same way, if you were cutting your chromosome with enzyme 2, then you'd have to make sure that you cut open your plasmid with enzyme 2 as well, so that the sticky ends will be complementary to each other. Now we've opened our chromosome and got our gene out of it and we've cut open our plasmid, then we use DNA ligase. It's an enzyme that seals sticky ends and seals blunt ends. So that is used to seal the DNA fragment, in other words, the gene that you want, into the bacterial plasmid to form a recombinant plasmid containing the DNA that you want in there mentioned before in a previous slide about the tools of the trade and one of those was the vector so we've looked at our enzymes the vector is basically the carrier the thing that carries the DNA from the genome of one organism to the genome of another and that vector can either be a plasmid or it can be an artificial chromosome so when that vector carries the DNA from one organism to another we've got a transformation that takes place. In other words, the bacteria host cell that the plasmid gets into is transformed. Now, to act as an effective vector, a plasmid and as well as that, an artificial chromosome will also have these features that are going to be described in the vector. It needs to have a restriction site and we just talked about the restriction sites in the previous slides. It also needs to have a marker gene. And the marker gene, we kind of talked about before as well, it enables the scientist to determine 
whether the wholesale has successfully taken up the plasmid vector. For example, a plasmid could have the marker gene for resistance to an antibiotic, ampicillin, and therefore when it's cultured in a medium containing ampicillin, any host cells that have failed to take up the recombinant plasmid die because they've not got the resistance to ampicillin. The other essential feature is this origin of replication. Now, this consists of genes that control self-replication of the plasmid DNA. So it's an essential site for making um, lots of copies of the plasmid within the transformed bacterial host cell. Because it's not just a case of just having a wee bacteria with its plasmid with the gene in it that you want. And it will also have its own other bacteria as well. Not bacteria. DNA, it, what you want it to do is actually produce multiple copies of this plasmid with the gene in it that you want. And because it produces these multiple copies of that gene or many copies of the gene, they will be expressed and you get more product from fewer cells. And that is very cost effective. The other thing that the origin of replication is involved with is in the regulation of sequences so that allow control of existing genes. So it controls these regulatory sequences that control existing genes that they're, they are present already in the plasmid. And also it's involved in controlling the expression of the actual inserted gene. So there are three things that this origin of replication that are helping with. They're helping with self-replication of the plasmid. It helps as well with controlling regulatory se sequence of the existing genes. So control existing gene regulatory sequences. And lastly, it's also involved in controlling expression of the inserted gene. So pretty important. Now, artificial chromosomes, as I said before, have also got these features. They're all also as well, these chromosomes are produced artificially by scientists. The advantage of these is that they're able to carry more DNA, so you can carry a much longer sequence of DNA from the donor organism to the recipient mi mi uh, microorganism. Now all this sounds great for your money making project, all you've got to do is find your eukaryotic, your human gene for example that can produce something useful, you can stick it into your bacteria and you've even got the advantage if you've got your origin of replication in your vector, your bacteria produce lots of plasmids with lots of those genes, and so you have got the advantage of being able to grow even less bacteria. You can grow all that bacteria, produce the substance, and hey presto, you make lots of money. But there are some problems with using a prokaryote to carry eukaryotic information, and that is that there's differences in eukaryotic and prokaryotic DNA. Now remember, Eukaryotes, we've got introns and we've got exons. Now the thing is, with, with bacteria, there's no introns. There are exons, but there's no introns. So what happens is, you don't get any of that mRNA modification. Thinking back, remember you get the splicing out of the introns on your DNA and you're just left with your exons, that is the genes that are expressed. So imagine then you've got your human gene and you've got, we'll call these the expressed genes, these red blobs. And remember then we cut out or after the mRNA we messenger molecule is made, 
then there's a splicing out of the introns from the messenger mRNA molecule and that's called mRNA modification. Now that doesn't happen with the bacteria so therefore what happens is you just end up with the whole of this with the introns and with the exons in it. So these parts that are in here, the intron parts, they get translated as well and so you could end up with a protein which is inactive because it's not folded properly. You know, you've got extra amino acids that will be put into your protein and that will affect its folding, making it inactive. The other thing is that bacteria do know post-translation modification. So remember that is when maybe after your protein is made, something else is added to it, a carbohydrate or something like that. And it may be that that post-translational modification is essential for the protein to function. And so if your bacteria cell isn't going to do that, then you're going to be producing again a molecule that isn't going to be functioning properly. So that ain't going to be very good. The other thing is that some bacteria cells don't actually secrete the, the protein that you want into the surrounding medium. And in fact, sometimes they might even degrade them before it can be recovered. Now, some of these problems can be overcome by chemical means. Um, but there are situations where, in order to get around this, then you would maybe use a eukaryotic cell, such as a yeast, to produce your desired protein, even although yeasts are, are a bit more demanding in trying to grow them. But there's no point in trying to grow something in a bacterial cell if it's not going to produce your product. So spend a bit more money and use the yeast and you can get the product that you want. And yippee, we are at the end of key area 2.7.